If you are a South African and you can recall the last time you experienced load shedding as a result of the state's electricity utility not being able to meet demand, then you must have a pretty good memory because it hasn't happened in a while. Which obviously means then that South Africa has enough energy to keep the lights on. But is that necessarily true? You know, when I was in South Africa, I saw some really troubling uh, things underway. One is that some people in South Africa think that South Africa has enough power now just because the lights aren't going out anymore. That's really not true. Some South Africans have enough power and others have none. Right now, the disparity in the inequality in South Africa is really, really desperate high. Now, that's a problem not only for today, but for tomorrow, because the South African population is still increasing quite strongly. That was the voice of Ben Hurd. He's the founder of a company called Bright New World. Bright New World is a new environmental organization. Ben recently came down to South Africa to investigate what the country needs in terms of energy. He's a proponent of one of the biggest bones of contention in South Africa right now. What is that you might ask? It goes by the name of nuclear energy. This week on Quintessential Talks, we talk South Africa's energy mix. So where do we currently stand? ESCOM has vowed to close four coal power stations in South Africa by 2020. We are gonna try and be less reliant on coal and move towards renewable power from independent power producers. The coal sector is not entirely happy with this move. And then the president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, decided to shuffle his cabinet of ministerial position holders. The Department of Energy got a brand new boss. And now the independent power producers don't know that they will be installing any new projects in South Africa. So if we don't know where our renewable energy is going to come from, then why are we closing down our coal power stations? Don't you think the closure of four coal power stations is like cutting our nose off to spite our face? Yes, I think it does. And I wouldn't want my position to be um, misread with regard to coal. Yeah, as, a, as a, someone who's got a very deep concern in relation to climate change, yes, ultimately my goal is to see the use of coal dwindle and then disappear worldwide. But the people who have the first and biggest responsibility to stop using coal is a country like Australia, uh, where we are a fully developed nation that is, that is wealthy, and we need to be leading that transition. In the South African context, you yes, you need to make an important contribution to managing climate change. However, you also have an enormous uh, problem of economic growth um, tied to the need for huge poverty alleviation, and a reliable electricity supply that is absolutely crucial. So my first priority for South Africa would be to ensure that any new construction of power is not fossil fuel powered. I wouldn't be racing to shut down coal plants to replace them. Um, that would lead, you know, potentially lead South Africa to going nowhere very fast in terms of economic growth. What I would want to see South Africa be able to do is, in planning for its future electricity generation needs, make that mix a clever mix of nuclear and renewable technology. So the only step forward is nuclear energy. However, there is some skepticism from South Africans and environmental groups and just generally people who care who say that the nuclear deal we were going to sign with Russia that was going to amount to about a trillion rand was going to absolutely bankrupt the country, cause mass amounts of debt for future generations and members of the ruling party, including the Gupta family, we're going to profit from a nuclear deal. And then this happened. You're watching TVC News Hour. South Africa's controversial push to build a fleet of new nuclear plants suffered a setback on Wednesday after the High Court ruled a pre agreement with Russia was unlawful and should be set aside. South Africa, which has the continent's only nuclear power station, has asked power utility ESCOM to procure an additional 9,600 megawatts of new capacity as it diversifies its energy mix away from aging coal-fired plants. Uh, but I think I've seen you say this before, that if Kuberg in South Africa works, then uh, another nuclear power station will potentially work. Can you get behind that kind of statement where you say, if a country has a working nuclear power station, then another one shouldn't be a scary thing for a country to implement? Well, sure. I guess what I'm trying to get at there is that South Africa as a country is not coming from zero in terms of nuclear knowledge, nuclear technology, and nuclear regulation. You have a lot of these systems and structures in place, and you actually have a lot of domestic knowledge in the nuclear power sector already. It should, in pa on paper, be 
um, easier for a country like South Africa to expand its nuclear sector uh, than necessarily come from absolute zero in terms of knowledge and regulation. I um, have just become aware of these events um, from yesterday, and I haven't looked into the details of them, but it sounds like a potentially destructive step backwards, and it does concern me. Um, it concerns me that progress that has been made toward new clean energy for South Africa is being stymied, and no one will win out of this. Now, what I found when I was in South Africa is that there are strong and absolutely understandable concerns about the interface between any large project, including this large nuclear project, and the existing um, government and concerns about corruptions. These concerns are absolutely legitimate, but we need to keep these matters separate. Corruption is a problem no matter what energy pathway South Africa takes. In order to meet the sheer scale of energy need in South Africa, there is no small response. There is no um, little gentle intervention that will meet South Africa's energy needs for the next few decades. Whatever is going to be done is going to be large. It's going to have the, the risk um, of negative impacts from corruption. So what I'm concerned to see and hear is that nuclear is being singled out um, in that fight. Or I guess the, the more correct way of looking at it is that the corruption argument is being used as a proxy argument against nuclear technology. Um, and those who oppose nuclear technology are very good and very clever at finding any possible way to delay uh, and put off any progress. And by doing that for long enough, uh, they can score victories because delays are costly. I guess what I'd really like the South African people to appreciate is that there is no um, simple, smooth, gentle path out of the really serious energy conundrum that the country is currently facing. So Ben and a team of researchers recently compiled a report called The Burden of Proof, a comprehensive review of the feasibility of 100% renewable electricity systems. They took 24 other studies that claimed that 100% renewable electricity systems were possible and basically discredited them, finding that they could not guarantee basic feasibility. So if the fake news brigade is trying to discredit nuclear energy, and the engineering of renewable systems still needs a ton of research, what should a prospective engineering student who's about to start his higher education journey do when he goes to university? What should he study? Because the public and paid for opinion says one thing and the counter opinion says the other thing. So what should they be studying? Look, I think that's a great, a great question. I, I think the best thing to do to future proof anyone's studies in engineering is to do with the ethic that you're bringing to your studies. and. You know, that's what we're getting at in terms of this paper that we've written is that what we all need to remain focused on is coming up with optimal solutions. An optimal solution for an electricity supply system, which, by the way, is a pretty complex beast, is going to involve all sorts of things. It's going to involve a lot of nuclear um, technology and its use. And definitely the world is crying out for a new generation of nuclear engineers. All over the world, we're seeing a huge skills gap in nuclear engineering. So there's a huge future there for, for people that want it. We're also going to, you know, I think, do a lot more with the storage of energy, potentially on shorter timescales than people think, but it can be hugely valuable in um, managing peak demand. It can be hugely valuable in taking advantage of lower cost variable renewable energy. These are really beneficial avenues to work in. We need um, engineers who can design smarter grid systems so that we can incorporate and balance and get the best out of all of our different energy supply options. All of these skills are incredibly valid. I think the most powerful and potent engineers are going to be the ones who, irrespective of their specific skill set, are applying it through a lens of trying to create an optimal system where we keep all solutions on the table. Those are the people that we need, the people that can see the big picture of the outcomes that we need and are able to apply solutions accordingly. And if you take, for example, where I live, South Africa, and where you live, uh, South Australia and where you live, South Africa, um, both of our countries will do relatively a lot with wind and solar, um, relatively little with hydroelectricity, um, and hopefully both of us will do a lot with nuclear technology as well. 
Other parts of the world, Northern Europe, for example, they're going to do far less with solar, far more with wind and hydroelectricity. So these things are quite geographically dependent, particularly when it comes to renewable energy. But the neat thing about nuclear technology is that it's not geographically dependent. It, it applies really nicely all over the world. So I think in, engineers who are anyone who's looking to create an overall clean system can feel very encouraged that they've got a big future in front of them, particularly if they don't get too hung up on specific solutions, but bear in mind that what we need, we need are effective and optimal combinations of solutions. I just wish we would listen to engineers more. I mean, so much of the paper that we've discussed, um, you know, required me to delve into what's actually just the bread and butter of electrical engineers. And it's just such crucial work that that most people in society don't understand at all. So, you know, I was pleased to be able to bring up some of the issues that the engineers have been raising with me. If you had eyes to hear, ears to hear and eyes to see, you would have not appointed four finance ministers in less than three years. You would not have recalled our finance minister, one of our finest finance ministers, from an international roadshow. You would, you would not be pursuing, you would not be pursuing a nuclear deal that will be the destruction of all of us. That was Barbara Hogan delivering a speech at her late husband Ahmed Katrada's memorial service. But wait, would that nuclear deal really have led to the destruction of all of us? Did she mean financially or did she mean literally destroy us as a nation? Because events like these have happened. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. The Soviet version is this. One of the atomic reactors at the Chernobyl atomic power plant in the city of Kiev was damaged. And there is speculation in Moscow that people were injured and may have died. Well, breaking right now, radiation levels inside a Fukushima nuclear power plant damaged by that tsunami nearly six years ago is now at their highest point since that disaster. But are these events necessarily evidence that we should continue to leave nuclear in the past and never pursue a nuclear future? Ben weighs in as he concludes. As an advocate, um, which I've been now for sort of going on six years, the longer I've been doing it, the more I try to um, not come down too specifically on the side of um, particular technologies uh, because things do change. Um, what I've seen over time from the data, first and foremost, is that the nuclear power sector has only ever been very safe. Um, and that's a really, really crucial thing to appreciate. Even with what people regard colloquially as old technology, the sort of 50 years of nuclear power experience that we have around the world has shown us that it's an incredibly safe uh, way of generating electricity with a couple of high-profile accidents, uh, neither of which have been as bad as the worst fossil fuel accidents. So I think it's very important that we don't let perfection get in the way of excellence. The existing nuclear power sector that we have in terms of light water reactor technology is actually very, very good. 